All right, who's ready for a brand new episode of Channel Chasers? Because I guarantee you it's going to be a hoot. I promise. <laughs> I promise that's going to be the only one. Okay, I'm lying. There's going to be a lot more. But um, regardless to this week's episode of Channel Chasers, of course, as always, I am your host, Jay, from TV Time with Jay. And joining me, as always, is my friend, my co-host, and self-proclaimed sidekick, or you could say apprentice, you know, in this context, I guess. Um, Brian Kersey. How you doing tonight, Brian? Hoot hoot! Hello, everybody. <laughs> All right. So, this is an episode I have been looking forward to doing pretty much since the show started. Uh, if you can't tell by the title and or thumbnail, or by the owl puns, we are talking about The Owl House, Season 1, Disney Channel's yep. newest breakout hit. And I emphasize now. Um, now, granted, um, granted, I have not been um, always up to date on, like, reviewing and totally missed out on the finale. And uh, Jay kind of got sidetracked because of the whole... Uh, yeah, the whole Blair mishap. You, yep. YouTube Blair mishap, but uh, this is a show that we kind of early on grabbed on and yep. kind of suspected would be a hit. Yeah, and you know what? For the first time in like months, we can start an episode without uh, without saying, oh yeah, we did <laughs> an episode about the previous season on the original incarnation of this show. Because this is a brand spanking new show, and man, was this a breath of fresh air. Oh my god. Uh, mm -hmm. As Brian alluded to, I covered a good majority of the season on the now defunct uh, video sharing site, Blair.tv. Unfortunately, um, Blair ran into some issues, and uh, as I said, it's now defunct, Um and that was the whole reason I couldn't, like, upload reviews for the last few episodes of it. Um, and, you know, they had a pretty decent audience over there. Uh, but uh, thankfully, I was still able to do a season review uh, in time once I, like, rebuilt the YouTube channel. Which, by the way, before we officially get started, I just want to say thank you to all the, uh, all, either, like, my OG people who, like, realized I was back. Because uh, I, I got quite a few of those. And some of the new people who, you know, uh, gravitated from, like, Lovecraft Country and, like, you know, obviously the Erpers are always great. Um, so thank you guys for that. Uh, I was honestly really, I was both excited and nervous to come back to YouTube um, after, you know, my original channel was deleted. I mean, I've mentioned this pretty much in every single episode of this podcast. I'm not going to uh, waste your time on that one. But... Seriously, though, guys, uh, thank you for the warm welcome back to, you know, anyone watching this on the YouTube version. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is a show I've been looking forward to talking about. So, Brian, uh, this is more fresh in your mind. I mean, we're not going to obviously go into spoilers, but thoughts on uh, this season and kind of what were you thinking when the show first started? Like, and uh, what were you, your expectations and have those expectations been met? Well, um, to begin with, um, when I started the show, I really didn't know too much about it. Uh, Jay told me some of the behind-the-scenes stuff with it, and about like who the showrunner is, and uh, you clearly tell early on that uh, even as just a, a star, this definitely has a like feel of Alex Hirsch too type show. Yeah. With the fact that uh with just the whole feel of it and, and uh, the fact that he provides it, the voice of one of the main cast. Yeah. Um, but but yeah just watching it initially I was like holy crap this is so weird but I love it. Yeah, and, I mean, that that's kind of just, uh, how, that's how the best way to sum up this show, just overall. It's so weird, but I love it. And, the, the, and the, oh, my bad. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say, and uh, 
just as the season went on more and more, of course, in the typical, like, I hate that I'm going to keep saying this, but I don't know how else no, it, to it, say it. It, come, it, and, comes from, like, it comes from that family tree, so it's totally fine to make the comparison. Yeah, the, the like, shows that Alex Hirsch usually has a, usually has a uh-huh. finger in, um, even though that sounded weird, sorry. Uh, but It's only weird if you make it weird, like, buddy. It starts off like you think it's just going to be one thing, and then it leads you in this surprise, like, really big overarching story with all these mysteries, and it just keeps growing. Yeah, for sure. It just keeps growing, and uh, also somehow has this awesome cast of a combination of um a combination of complete unknowns to like TV veterans and like and, and animation royalty in terms of voice acting well actually she's royalty in both in terms of both regular live acting and animation I mean uh, if you're talking about Ida. I, well, I wasn't just, I wasn't talking about Ida. I was talking about uh, Amity, you know, Mae Whitman. Mae Whitman oh, has yeah. been all... Mae Whitman? She's a, obviously uh, a huge star in live action currently with the Good Girls, but also she has quite the storied history with uh, animation as well. American Dragon Jake Long, and let's not forget one of the greatest, if not the greatest, cartoons of all time, Avatar The Last Airbender. She is the voice of Katara. Uh, so like And she voiced April O'Neil for a while. Yep, in the um yeah, in the amazing uh twenty twelve TMNT uh reboot cartoon. Probably the best and uh, she and she's been in several great like live action nerdy stuff, like Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Yep. Mm-hmm. But and then you've got Prudence from the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Yeah, you would not expect that because the voice is just so different. Uh, but yeah, that's crazy. Yep. Uh, she plays yep. Willow, and then Ida and sorry, no, I was just saying she plays Willow. Um, but yeah, go ahead. And then you got Ida, the owl lady herself, the one who owns the namesake of the show, and. Uh, she is a TV legend, going as back as far as uh, shows like Just Shoot Me and Frasier. Yep. And uh, and then I've never um, seen Just Shoot Me, but I I am familiar with her work on Frasier. Uh, Just Shoot Me was great. It had a uh, it had a, a pre-fame David Spade and. Uh, one of the other big stars of it was Veronica's dad on Veronica Mars. Oh, cool. Good for Keith. Nice. Nice. That was like how he got his start, I think, too. That's pretty dope. And uh, had several other familiar faces. And uh, it was a good show for the time. It was definitely like kind of like pre-office office because... It was a workplace comedy type thing. Interesting. But it definitely had like the vibe of like Frasier and all those shows back then. But anyway, uh, back to this show. To the fact where uh, the we don't meet him until way later on. But the Grand Emperor of this world. Yep, Emperor Boyle. Do you know who that was? His voice sounded really familiar. Could not play, dude. Him. That's Perry Mason. What? Like Matt? Re- oh, I, 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 wait. I was like, wait a minute. At first, I was like, uh, I was like, wait, he died like in the two thousands. The remake. Oh, Perry Mason. you mean? Oh, you mean? You mean? Uh, you mean Reese? You mean? Okay, you mean? Yeah. You mean Matthew Reese? Okay, I was Matthew like, Reese. when you said Perry Mason, I was like, oh shit, really? Well, I was like, wait, <laughs> no, he's dead. <laughs> Yeah, my bad. My bad. I should have said a uh, remake. You should have said uh, home. But, you yeah. should have said homeboy from the Americans. <laughs> but yeah, um, homeboy from the Americans is the emperor. 
That's crazy. Uh, the Americans mm-hmm. is also an amazing show, by the way, you guys. Like uh, that ended. That was one of the like stronger endings within the last decade or so. Um, or well, actually, it ended like relatively recently. So I would say within the last five years. Uh, the Americans is also fantastic. Um, and then also, um, this show has a very um, young but still very popular. Um, young actor. Are you talking about the kid from who, Raven's well, Home? Yep. Yeah, he, he's really good. Who also, who also voiced one of the leads in uh, Costume Quest. Oh, yeah! Dude, co- you know, we never actually followed up on Costume Quest. Costume Quest was really fucking good. Mm-hmm. Oh, we gotta look into that later. I'll, we'll talk about that off mic. Um, but yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, so it had a great cast and a weird, interesting story. I mean, and obviously, like, the animation style is just fantastic. Uh, as Brian said, uh, Dana Torrance, one of the lead, you know, animators and writers from Gravity Falls, uh, is the creator and showrunner of the show. It's very similar to how, like, you know, uh, like, Pendleton, Pendleton Ward, um, you know, created Adventure Time and then you know, Rebecca Sugar, uh, who worked on Adventure Time, goes on to create, you know, a, a, just a, a little tiny known show out there about sentient rocks called, um, what was it? Steve, uh, uh Stefan Galaxy, um, you know, uh, Christopher Cosmos. But anyway, Steven uh... Universe. There you go. That's the name of it. Steven Universe. Uh, but yeah. Acting. Um, Speaking of uh, Steven Universe real quick, though, like, I'm not going to lie, Owl House hit at the perfect time because I was super paranoid that nothing was going to, like, fill the Steven Universe-shaped void in my heart after the uh, ending of Steven Universe Future. And Owl House literally came right around the time of uh, Steven Universe Future wrapping up. Uh, So it was just a perfect transition. Um, obviously, they're two completely different shows with two completely different tones, but mm-hmm. to have another like very strong, very um, positive animated show that like this is the type of stuff that like Disney um, animation like both in terms of the movies and the cartoons is known for um, animated properties that don't talk down to their audience. And mm-hmm. are very much, even though they're like quote unquote children's programming, they deal with very mature topics, handle things with care. Uh, it's very, it's you know, a trait that Stephen had. It's a trait that Adventure Time had. Regular show isn't necessarily a children's program. Uh, it's definitely uh, way geared towards more adults. But regular show also was watched by a lot of kids, and you know, kids still understood that and enjoyed it a lot. So it very much has that same kind of vibe and energy of those like new golden age 2010 mm-hmm. era cartoons. Well, um, also in the same fact of Steven Universe, which I still need to, I still need to watch most of it. Um, it, but I still know this about it. It definitely carries on the themes of, um, of. Like Na- found natural, family, yeah, found family and natural diversity instead of like you know the, the yep. typical agenda based one that the CW tends to kind of lean into. No offense, and CW, then, but and full then, offense um, intended. And then the balance also with Steven Universe, the balancing of of uh, action, comedy, heart. Being oh, really my. weird but grounded at the same time. One hundred percent. Um, like I said, they are very much two different shows, and they explore um much different themes, like thematically. Uh, that's a double negative. Uh, they explore um you know much different things thematically, but they do have like the same similar foundation, like as what Brian was saying. Like they have a lot of heart behind them. 
you get emotionally invested really quick. And also very similar to Steven Universe. Um, like the plot isn't front stage, right? It's very much drip fed to you in the same way Steven Universe did it, right? Because also, lot... um, oh yeah, go ahead. Also similar to Gravity Falls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the... but they don't. But but uh, it's similar to Gravity Falls, but it doesn't go as like cryptid and secretive as Gravity Falls did. Yeah, yeah. Gravity Falls definitely had like a like a D and D X Files type vibe to it. Um which I, I you know obviously And love. I mean um just to the point where uh if you guys hadn't seen it, the whole fact that um the end title card for every episode had secrets that you had to decode. And you know there was a message. Alex Hirsch always left a message at the end of uh, at the end of the title card, uh, but you had to play backwards to hear what he said. Um, yeah, so uh, that just goes to show you the level of cryptic detail the man went into. Yep. All, but uh, yeah, like um, the, the and also something that like is just another major selling point for uh, Owl House. Uh, you know, before we get into the actual meat and potatoes of the conversation. Um, if you are an, a Harry Potter fan, and I mean like a hardcore Harry oh, Potter yeah. fan, uh, like yours truly, uh, you know, this is obviously not a, vid- a vidcast that you can't see it. But if you've seen any of my videos, you've seen that big ass bookshelf behind me and front and center are all eight Harry Potter books in hardcover form. Uh, fucking either first or second edition so like or at least you know as 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 early edition as i can find at the time uh the later books obviously i bought right off shelf because like that that i i was like prime age demographic for it but either way uh like i am a like massive potterhead uh i do not agree with the author uh, uh in any way shape or form let me go ahead and start that off uh but uh, those books will eternally have a special place in my heart, and you can tell from this show that maybe uh, you know even if it isn't uh, Dana herself, uh, the writing team behind this is definitely made up of some really hardcore Potter fans. Um, I'm not I'm not gonna spoil anything, but there's a specific episode that uh, wing it like witches. Yep, where that's it, the one where I, I, it I've goes. Li- I've literally had that exact rant. Um, yeah, I, and I, I was gonna say, didn't I? Didn't I actually? I had this co- a conversation with you about this. We were just kind of talking about Harry Potter, like not, not even before before Owl House even came out. I think we were. I mentioned Harry Potter in some way because we were. I guess we were talking oh. about houses or something. And I literally I, was like, I have this issue too, but. If, and we can go more detail in the spoiler, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Bo- bottom line: if you if you love Harry Potter and you love animation, Owl House is a match made in heaven. And it's not just a you know those cheap Harry Potter parody type things. The jokes that are made in here are such inside baseball type jokes that like you know who wrote that really had this issue. Because that is an issue only a hardcore Harry Potter fan, whether it be from the books or the movies, uh, will have. Uh, I guarantee you, unless you really just don't care about that particular part of the books or movies. Um, But, yeah. So, without further ado, we spent about a good 20 minutes or so on uh, trying to sell you on this amazing show. So, go watch it. Uh, You definitely should because i i guarantee you man this this is one of those it started at the top of the decade and it starts off i mean even though the decade itself did not start up on a good foot by any means uh in terms of like animated content uh, owl house kicked off the 2020s like with a strong start yeah it was definitely one of the shines of this year and so without further ado yeah let's get into let's get into spoilers oh my god this show okay so first thing i want to compliment this show about is the pacing any other show and i'm gonna even throw shade at steven universe for this 
uh, because I understand why they did it, but I can also understand fans' complaints about this. The first season is 50 episodes, right? And you don't really get anywhere with the plot until we get to, like, episode, like, 40-ish, maybe, like, 35. Uh, where you start getting shit out of the plot and it ends on like the big plot relevant cliffhanger. With this show, they don't waste any time. They do not waste any time. Um, mm-hmm. None of it feels rushed either. Um, the relationship stuff that happens in it, like that you would expect other shows, even hell, even some live action shows, to take an entire season to like drag out a will they, won't they, and then, you know either deliver on it or just completely miss out on it, even though there are open signs that the other person is clearly into that person. <laughs> Supergirl, um, looking at you. Not even going to try to cough there. Supergirl, I'm looking at you. I'm looking directly More at you. More specifically, Supercore. Yes, but yeah. So, you know, uh, it does not drag its feet at all, and I really appreciate it, because... I feel like with this show, they've definitely seen their fair share of things. And they're like, okay, uh, we know what they expect. So let's subvert it by, like, you know, building to this organically, but not adding fluff. There's no fluff Mm -hmm. in this show. Even the things that you think are fluff have payoff later on. And it's just like, well, damn. Um, yeah, like, even, like, smaller things, like, now that I'm thinking about it, there, there was, there was an episode with, uh, one of my favorite, like, side characters, which I'll just go ahead and say, because we're in the spoiler section, Albert. Yep, and you find and even, oh, go ahead. I was. What were you gonna say? Uh, I was just gonna say, yeah. In, in that episode, you think it's just a filler, but then it actually, you know, does a huge, like, you know, step in terms of like world building, and explaining the magic system, and also giving you a hint to something that we haven't even seen yet, and then it, which is likely gonna be in season two. And also, uh, one other subtler thing about that episode is uh, that helps to create a connection between Luz and Albert. So, in the in the finale, yep, Albert. When Luz has to use Albert, yep, he completely cooperates, and she gets to go full power mode, which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Um, another thing I want to like, I want to bring up, yeah, is just characterization, man. Like characters that you think are going to be the most annoying thing on the face of the earth, <laughs> turn out to actually be crazy useful. And if you watch the show, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Because <laughs> that's why I'm laughing. That's the whole joke of his character. Nobody wants to be around him. Nobody wants to talk to him. Because he's just the worst. But man, what? I would be lying to you if I did not say that Hootie comes through when you need him. Mm-hmm. Like uh, he takes down a whole army all by himself. Yep. And he's just so like funny and nonchalant about it. He goes, yay, friends! Like, oh, look, I'm a human! Da, 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 da. Boom! Oh, hey, Lilith. Oh, why did I go into a Mickey Mouse voice? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Why did I go super mega high when I tried to do Hootie earlier? But yeah. I no. don't know. Um, but, I, but I guess I guess Mickey is kind of my like default with, animated voice. Um, which, uh, by the way, in case you guys didn't know, also Alex Hirsch. Yep. Uh, it's pretty hilarious. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Hootie, Hootie is like annoying, funny, but also like he's a, he's the source of some of like the surprisingly like dark and <laughs> graphic bits of humor. Like he yeah. he literally puppets some corpses, and I do realize that like you know the channel is like 
semi-monetized. Like I'm actually working on getting reapproved because like uh, I, I deactivated it for so long. But you know, we'll worry about we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But yeah, he puppets bodies, man. Like and like it's a kid's show. I mean, great, like they take full advantage of the clock slot. Uh, but like, dude, this is a kid's show. Like this reminds me of like you know. Again, not to sound like an old man, but like back when we were kids in the 90s and they were able to get away with so much like when you watch it as an adult, like, wait, this was on Cartoon Network? This is like, on Nickelodeon? Like the biggest one, like the biggest one, if you guys know this reference, you'll know it, but uh, Animaniacs, Fingerprints. Yep, yep. And like, yes, I mean that both ways. <laughs> oh man, oh uh, that 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 joke is pretty hilarious. Also, there's the infamous Rugrats joke with Grandpa, and uh, the the uh, the DVD, um, Lonely Space Vixens. <laughs> that's uh, oh, huh? No, no, not this one. That that that's for after you guys go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but. And also, but, one, one more time, one more thing though. This is my favorite adult joke that I caught as an adult that had me dying because I was, uh, I was showing my niece the Powerpuff Girls on Netflix back when it was on Netflix. I don't know if, it's, I don't know if it's still on there now, but uh, it was one of the later episodes where the girls had made that new friend, Robin, and um, they were explaining their origin story, and then um, what do you call it? The, the girls were like. Yeah, you know, Professor was ma- uh, mixing some chemicals, and he uh, he made us on accident. And then, you know, Robin, she kind of just laughs, and she looks at the Professor, and she goes, Huh, it's okay, Professor. My mommy said I was an accident, too. Oh, <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Bro, I was dying laughing. Of, of course, my little, my like at the time, like six, six-year-old niece did not understand the joke, but I almost peed my pants. Also, also Powerpuff Girls, him, the character himself. Oh yeah, true. Big facts, big facts. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, off of, off of general cartoons and back to the Owl House. Um, so, um, another another thing about characterization, um. This has some of my favorite character archetypes out there. Uh, you know, if I had to compare Well, this... um, just uh, real quick, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, finishing up with uh, Hootie. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hootie was really cool, and he's really annoying. And also, we do... I don't know if you, if you caught this or not, but they do confirm what Hootie is. Yeah, like he... What exactly he... He's the house spirit, right? Like... He's a demon. Oh yeah, he's a demon. Yeah, he's the house demon. Yeah, yeah. And so it explains because he definitely has some demonic moments, but then also, um... yeah, he's he's like a he's like a childish version of the House of Mystery for anybody who's familiar with DC Comics and you know John's cursed ass house. Um, K- kinda, yeah. But also, there is a. You talk about how uh, there was a specific reference to uh, to uh, Harry Potter, and we'll get there. But for now, there was also a big episode that was uh, Miyazaki. Yep. Which definitely is an influence in this show. Yeah. And, and, uh, and Hootie's yeah. Flying Castle. Yep. That where was Hootie a- actually grows feet due to a, a magical mishap. Yep, it, that and that was pretty. That was pretty hilarious. Um, so yeah, uh, piggybacking off of that and talking about characters, uh, like I said, this show has some of my favorite character archetypes, just in general, just in fiction, shit that I always love. Uh, honestly, if I had to make a live action comparison, like in terms of show tone and feel, I would say like this very much reminds me of another favorite of ours. Uh, if you've been listening to the podcast. Uh, or watching either of our channels, Legacies very much gives me that kind of mm-hmm. vibe. Very much gives me that kind of vibe. I, I'm telling you, 
if you like if you like the Owl House, you will enjoy the show Legacies on the CW. And Brian can tell you because Brian is not familiar that all that familiar with the overall franchise. You do not have to have watched Vampire Diaries to enjoy it. Um, no, no, you don't. It uh, it adds to it, but you don't have to. And um, I will say that uh, that uh, there is. A ship in this show that reminds me of a lot of it. Yeah, I'm glad you're picking. That up reminds me a lot of a fan ship on yep. Legacies. Yep, yep. It's very, it's very much that particular ship. Uh, and honestly, like I, I've grown to not be like a pusher of that ship, but it, it's one that I like. It's one that I like. It's one of the, it's one of those crack ships that I enjoy. Um, but yeah, so um. Speaking of that, uh, I want to talk about like I, I, I'm I was, like jumping several squares to like my favorite character of the show, but I want to talk about my favorite character of the show, Amity Blight. Okay, so if y'all know me, if y'all know me, there's one character archetype that will get me to love a character almost instantly, and this archetype is of course. The bitch with a heart of gold. And right off, and I have like a sixth sense for this type of thing. First time we see her, I'm just like, oh, I know where this is going. Oh, please tell me this is where I think it's going. And it went there, and it went there way quicker than I expected. We didn't have to deal with an entire season of her being a bitch. We got to see that heart very early well, on. Um, and they also, like with how they usually do with things, flipped it to the fact where uh, we can just go ahead and say it because we're talking about her. Yep. Uh, they do a ship thing and it's her having the crush. Yep. Yeah, man, the Lumanity ship is strong, and I am right there. Because, damn it, I love that ship. Um, also, I, I just really enjoy that, like, very, and, you know, again, not to, like, constantly bring up Steven Universe, but Steven Universe is obviously the biggest show to deal with these kind of uh, topics. But very similar to Steven Universe, um, you know, LGBT characters are brought in organically, and it's not made a big deal out of it. You see that Amity has a crush on Luce, but nobody's like, oh, you're into girls? It's just like, oh, you like Luce. Cool. Yeah, and uh, her so crush... Many, it, yeah, it's the cutest thing ever. There's so much, there's so many like, little adorable gay panic moments. Uh, like, I love uh, it. Like one point where, uh, where she breaks... If she like hurts her leg and yeah, Luz at the end of the, carries at the end her. Of the, yeah, she's like, you know, I, I couldn't carry you. She goes, no, 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 I'm, I'm fine. And then uh, Luz just go, literally just goes, scoop. She goes, oh, wow, sports. Uh, 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 um, who's Amity? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's great. It's, she's so cute, man. <laughs> she's so damn cute. And also, there's even more layers to it because, like, you, we saw very early on that she uh, bullied Willow, and we thought that was just kind of like a standard, like, bully the nerdy kid arc. But there's so much more depth to it. We find out that they used to be best friends, and it's kind, it's like a one of those classic scenarios. And I thought it was going to go, like, the super, super cliche route, especially considering that Amity is at the very least bi. Uh, we haven't actually seen her show Interested Dude, so I'm going to just say at the very least, because it's not, you know, officially confirmed if she's gay. Uh, but, um, you know, we I thought there might have went the, the, the cliche route of where, like, Amity, like, you know, had, you know, showed some feelings towards Willow, but then pushed Willow away when Willow was like, I'm not into that, but I still want to be your friend. Uh, so I'm glad they didn't do that. But they did something a lot more interesting, like where like Amity uh, like confronted her own insecurities and her own like the weight of her family legacy because she is the family's prodigy. Different and things like her this. family told her to break 
Yep. And it, it, it's very much, she, she's like, the, the loose Amity relationship to bring up Harry Potter again is like a female equivalent to Dreary. Um, and Dreary, if um, I've read, and I've read a lot of, I've read, I've read a lot, and I mean a lot of Dreary fan fiction, and this is very much the well, route that they it's go. It's Dreary if if uh, J.K. wasn't, you know, J.K. If J.K. wasn't J.K., yeah, and mm-hmm. uh, actually uh, had balls to do dreary and yep. uh, give an actual literal child a redemption arc. Yep. Instead, instead of, of the grown ass man, still being who... an asshole. Yes. Um. But yeah, no, 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 for uh, for sure. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie; I also contributed to that. I'm not a I'm not a personal I'm not a personal dreary shipper um, myself, but I do appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I I am very I'm very much uh, um, I, the, I'm very much a Harry Hermione shipper. No offense to Ron, people love Ron, but you know we're not gonna get into that. That's a whole deeper I, conversation. I that I, I can personally hold. ship Ron and Hermione, but. Um... But uh, and I don't canonically ship um dreary, but uh, there are some cosplayers that do an AU that really has me shipping their version of dreary. Listen, dreary when in put in the right hand is amazing. Okay, and that's what we got with Amity and Luce. Amity and Luce are a female mm-hmm. equivalent to dreary, except. Like, you know, Harry was able to get through to Draco and, like, get him to finally say, oh, no, my parents are the bad ones. I don't actually want to do this. I'm just a kid. I want a Mm -hmm. friend. I want somebody to actually care about me for me. Those, if if you've read any type of dreary fan fiction, that's usually the route that they go. With uh, with Dreary's relationship, especially if they're doing like retellings of like the books from a Dreary like type of POV, um, it's very much like you know in that first meeting, you know, uh, Harry actually shakes Draco's hand and he you know he gives him a shot and he shows him the right way, which is what Luce does, right? You know, Amity, it's not her fault because you know the way the society works in this world is very much similar to a Harry Potter type world where it's very elitist. And, you know, power dictates your status and your family is very much in control of uh, who you hang out with, um, you know, what is right for you. And it's very much a conformist type society. Now, wizard society Uh, is a lot more loose than mm -hmm. what we have in the Owl House. But, uh, you know, it's a very similar structure, which is why, you know, Amity and Luce's friendship and hopefully eventual relationship uh, is such a like breath of fresh air. Indeed, um, and the whole thing about the structure, what further proves this is the fact that uh, the thing that breaks Willow and Ebony's friendship initially is the fact that Willow is a late bloomer. Yeah. Now we find out that once she does actually get her magic, she's pretty damn powerful. <laughs> And, uh, like, Bloom in quite the literal sense, because you find out she is basically, like, the witch equivalent of poison fucking ivy. Um, yeah, which, which she even has her own issues with the fact that that her parents wanted her to be abomination. Yeah, and, yeah she want, she, they wanted her to be in the abomination track, which is, uh, like, kind of similar to, like, making a homunculus, if you're familiar with, like, um, Full Metal Alchemist or even Fate. A uh, similar type of thing, you know, where you make a familiar and you like imbue it with a consciousness, um, which that's another thing that I really like about um, the Owl House that is uh, very similar to like a Steven Universe where, uh, you know, they feed you the bits of the lore and like mechanics of the world, but it never feels like they're pausing and like, like here's a tutorial. Like, you know what I'm saying? Every, like the, no. the question, the questions come up naturally, like. Okay, how does this work? 
it's like, oh, well, you just, you make this and you imbue, you use your magic to imbue uh, like a small amount of consciousness. It's not enough for it to like, obviously like rebel or anything, but it can follow simple commands. Yeah. And uh, to the fact where uh, they will uh, sometimes give you some of the lore in the form of a joke. Yep. Because, uh, because the whole thing about having heart and uh, it was like, oh yeah, that's right. People here have a little sack next to their heart. Yep. So I guess you do have to have heart. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, that it's all, it's all really cool. Like, the, the lore is presented really well. It's never, like, ham-fisted or forced. And, like, you're just really interested in the world and the characters. And, like and I said, they you... very slowly show you why Ida is an outcast in, like... Yeah, and um, it's very much lo- similar to, like, a... Um, Ty- she, she's, the, she's the rebel character. She's, like... She doesn't want to play by the rules. She doesn't want to follow the Empire. She has this, like, witch Han Solo-esque vibe. Um, mm-hmm. And I tell you, uh, another character that she kind of reminds me of mm-hmm. a little bit. I hate to go back to the show yet again. Oh, Gravity Falls? 100%. Grunkle In fact, Stan. Yeah, that's what I said. Grunkle Stan. Oh, yeah. I didn't um, even yeah. know that. Yeah, Grunkle Stan, 100%. I mean, so much so to the fact that, like, one of the first things people pointed out uh, is a, a speculation and a theory, like, very, very, early, like, right after the pilot of, uh, is this Stan the mysterious ex-wife? Because uh, they are very similar in personality. They even do kind of similar things with, like, you know, um, Ida, like, her main method of income is, like, hawking human garbage and, like, selling it as, like, mysterious treasures also um, also uh, somebody online yeah king, yeah king and Ida were featured in a wanted poster on the um in the yep. uh mystery shack um yep. that that was um something that was uh found pretty much like right after the pilot that is what led to this whole speculation of um you know Ida being the unnamed uh, ex-wife of Grunkle Stan that he's mentioned offhandedly a couple times. Um, and we know for a fact that, like, the Gravity Falls universe does operate on multiverse theory. And also Rick and Morty is somehow in this multiverse because Roiland um, is a big part of, obviously, you know, both shows. Um, we haven't heard Roiland yet. At least I don't think we have. But I- I'm very interested to see if well, he comes um, I think it's well, Roland. Um, I think he's like gotten into some hot water. No, that's Dan Harmon. Oh, Roland that's is, Harmon. Harmon is the one that has like the super problematic pilot that uh, old pilot that got released. Roland ain't doing shit. That's Dan Harmon. My bad. Roland is the good one. All right. You're. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, uh, anyway, it's uh. Yeah, so we haven't heard from him, and uh, honestly, oddly enough, we haven't seen too much of the human world. Which, you know, I definitely think is going to um, be a big factor in Season 2, especially considering the ending. Um, They're obviously going to try and find a way back. Um, Not just for Luce, but also to just kind of protect the human world, because it seems like Bellos's plan is for some kind of invasion, um, which we'll get to. We'll get we'll get to in a second because uh, I just want to just quickly address like Gus and uh, some of the other side characters very quickly, who I also really enjoy. Gus is amazing. I thought he was mm-hmm. going to be super. I thought he was going to be super annoying because he has the one joke they keep repeating with like his whole human obsession and not understanding how the human world works. I thought that was going to get old really quick, but they found uh, like nice ways to change it up. I really liked his developing friendship with King. Um, like mm-hmm. that was a really good episode as well. Um, also, uh, we find out we find out that uh, 
even though he is like a big cheerleader for the team and all that and like cheers them on to the fact where he literally cries when one of his flags breaks. Yep. Um, we also find out that uh, he is, and they don't make a big deal about it. But yeah, his, da- his he dad is, is insanely insecure. Yep. Um, like, he super even... insecure. Yeah, he, yeah, he uh, they even, like, show it when he, like, touches the ancient artifacts and is, like, you know, um, sh- I'll show me the get, past. I'll finally get to see my best self. And it's like, you were always your best self. And he starts to cry. He's like, oh, my God. Um, also, we find out something subtle. His dad is the uh, main anchor man that we've been seeing all throughout the show, which makes a lot of sense because he's the only other black character that we've seen in the show. Well, also, um, he, uh, his dad is voiced by a very, like, popular TV actor. Oh, yeah? Which actor? Uh, he's done a lot of things. Um, Malcolm in the Middle, he was uh, Stevie's dad. Oh, Stevie's dad. Cool. He's been in tons of TV shows and done a but, lot uh, of voices. Yeah. But he's, yeah, what, what, he's like, oh, yeah. he's like, he's like your, he's like in animation right now. He's kind of like, if you need a black guy and you can't get Phil Hart. Film that's h- that's hilarious, but also probably super accurate. Um, uh, but, but yeah, um, also like one other thing that I want to bring up because it's a, it's a big accent of the show. Principal Bump is amazing. I thought he was just going to be an asshole the whole time, but you can tell that he really <laughs> does care about his kids and like teaching. And I love his like funny little just subtle jabs at Eda. Like, yeah, my, uh, my, my, fav- my favorite thing, uh, my favorite joke from him was the, during the execution where he goes, uh, she, she made me realize mm-hmm. my love of teaching. Uh, she made me uh, g- uh, like regain my love of teaching again after she left. Um, <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, also, I, mm-hmm. he's very flawed too uh, when, uh, what's her name? The Triclops? Basha. Basha. It's Basha. Uh, uh, what's her name? Triclops. Chick? Can you not hear me? Can you not hear me? I said hello. Basha. You can't hear me. I, was I can hear you. you. Can't hear me. Okay. Uh, I said I said uh, her name is Basha. I said it like three times, so I wasn't sure. Sorry. If you were here. Um, my um, Apple Lady went off ah, and kind of gotcha. distracted things. Gotcha. Uh, but, it happens uh, to me all the time. But yeah, she, when she's like, it's her episode and it's showing at like how much of a big shit she is, Bump even says, uh, like, what, she got away with murder? Oh, okay. Well, at least that shows initiative. Yeah, like see, I, I, I like him because like, you know, he, at first you think he's a stereotypical bigot asshole, like he's going to be the main antagonist, like a Principal Weatherby in like an Archie comic. But like, it turns out he's just, a, he's a nice dude. Sure, he's weird and he has these like darker motifs, but that's just kind of the entire world in general. So like, that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm-hmm. And he's also and so very like, in a way... Because this is ironic, but human in the fact that he's flawed. Yeah. I, I also really dig his mask. He has a cool mask. I dig the mask mm-hmm. a lot. Oh. Um, he has a really interesting character design. Um, which, so, uh, yeah. Which, it, which uh, includes a very, um, let's say, Potter-esque robe. Yep. Yep. But, but yeah, moving on because we're at the fifty and, minute mark. Yeah, and the school itself uh, is a very interesting character within itself. Uh, it's not just a direct Hogwarts ripoff. Sure, they got a in a Sorting Hat joke, which you know, of course, they did. You uh, you can't do a Potter joke. Uh, you can't do a magical school without making a Sorting Hat joke. Understandable. Um, and I love but, their yeah. bell. Yep, that's pretty. <laughs> it's fantastic. a literal it, monster it, 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 that screams. 
Yep, because it gets whacked with a mallet, and so it screams in pain. Um, and then uh, so... at the at the dance, they bring in the scary creature from before. That's a turtle esque creature, and uh, they just put like gems on its back and has it yep. spinning for like fifty hours. Yep, and also. Also, another Harry Potter reference from the Garam episode um, is literally, no joke, this is ripped right from Harry Potter. I mean, obviously there are creatures in mythology that do this exact thing, but literally the whole Grom ritual and the Grom test is the exact same test for defense against the dark arts against a boggart. That is literally what a boggart is, that is literally what a boggart does turns into your worst fear uh bonus points if you remember what it turned into when it looked at neville longbottom do you know brian do you happen to know let me see let me test your pot mm. real quick what did it, what did the bogger turn into when uh it looked at neville longbottom and uh comments i will definitely give you bonus point if you t- if you say it in the comments luckily that we're recording this live so brian can't just look at the comments I could I'll be misremembering because like... I hadn't seen the yep. whole series. But didn't it turn into Neville? No, it did not. But you're on the right track. It turned into Professor Severus Snape. Oh, yeah. Yep, because Snape was such an asshole to him because Nev- if Neville was the chosen one instead of Harry, um, uh, Lily wouldn't have died, so Snape was kind of an asshole to Neville because he kind of blamed Yeah, him. but anyway, uh, just yeah, yeah. real quick, since we are mentioning Grom, I loved yeah. Lucy's outfit. That was amazing. She got to wear a tux, and also just so many cute little shit moments. She they got to dance. A, she wore they a got tux, dance but fight. she also wore a tutu? Yep, which is so loose. All, but yeah, she got to dance fight. The, the fucking boggart. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna call it a boggart because that's what it is. I know it's pro- the Grom monster, but it's a it's a fucking boggart. Let's it, be real. It was a uh, the Grom you something something. Where the real, the name of the Grom was named after it. We're gonna just simplify it and call it a boggart <laughs> because that's yeah. what it is. Um, but but that was a very good episode. And it, it, like, obviously brought back, it was the first time we, like, you know, got re-mention of the human world with Lucy's fear about lying to her mom. Um, And we also got a mystery that we still have. Yep. Yeah, okay, so I I do want to talk about that. This is the main reason I wanted to bring up this episode. So I mentioned it in my review on Blair. I didn't get to talk to you about it, Brian, because uh, you hadn't watched it at the time. So big theory that I have. Right. And um, like it's because of the end of that particular episode, we see Luce giving a like a narration like of her text to her mom and stuff like that. Um, And at the end of the episode, uh, we uh, we see um, like the tech, the response back from the mom. And she talks about, you know, I've been really enjoying the letters you've been sending. And then we also in that same shot, see Amity writing letters and also if you look at the letters that we see um, on Lucy's mom's uh, table, uh, the P is the same. Hmm. And the P is the same as the one on Amity's invitation. And Luce is spelled wrong. Just like it was on the invitation that she wrote for Luce. So Amity Damn. is likely the person but writing to Lucy's how mom. Does she I, have a... I don't know. That's the big mystery, Brian, but it is likely Amity who's doing it. And it's been driving me nuts this entire time and I finally get to tell you. Yeah, because that is a big mystery. There were a lot of big mysteries that uh, they never really touched upon. Like, you know, the whole Earth Titan thing? Yeah. Okay, so I have I have a big theory about that. We're just gonna jump right into speculation town. I'm here for it. Okay, okay. So we got the uh, at the end the big lore dump about like the Titan being uh, the uh, the skeleton that the island is made of. We see that the uh, Boiling Isles is made of a giant skeleton. 
right? We saw that very early on in the show, and we see that in the lore little storybook that King reads. Now, remember this. That skeleton, if you look at it, looks very similar to a character we know and love. And that character is, of course, King. My favorite character. King's name is King. King of Demons. Mm. So... And mm. we Mm-mm. and we know. Further, your thing. That's not his name. Oh yeah, it's just King. It's King of all monsters. Oh yeah. Oh shit. Okay. So yeah, King of I all believe. monsters. So that. So all right. If Brian's wrong, then Brian's wrong. If it is King of Demons, it's King of Demons. Either way, both uh, like are are valid points to my theory. Uh, yeah. King. Uh, the skeleton looks a lot like a bigger version of King. King's name is either King of Demons or King of Monsters. Um, and we know that the island itself and the Titan is what taught the witches wild magic. Ida is the only current practitioner besides Luce of wild magic. So naturally, if the island gave birth to a child a second titan that maybe takes way longer to grow and age they would entrust it to the only other person who can use wild magic that makes sense but also if you don't mind throw something else out there go ahead we're in speculation town what if it's like what if it's kind of like the avatar were the fact that he's reincarnated. Oh, so he's like the reincarnation of... Okay, I can see that. Okay, yeah. I mean, and also that would make sense why he has such a strong bond with Luce and why Luce was such a natural at Wild Magic and we saw that she was able to directly connect with the island in the episode where she learned how to do the ice magic as well. So, yeah. And um, also, a subtle mm -hmm. thing that they never really address... Mm Mm-hmm. When they do briefly go to the human world, Luce can't use magic. Yeah, because she's no longer on the uh, which I theorized was because she's no longer on the island and her, her magic is directly connected to her connection to the island. And also, yeah. King wasn't and also King wasn't with her in the human world. Yes, so he I, was. I also, was he? Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay, yeah. So never mind that. The the, the that part of that theory is kind of because I was a little bit... I was freaking out. I was like, "Kings in the human world." Okay, so uh, because, yeah, uh, so, because so maybe so maybe when King matures, he'll become more of like a a, a magic like. What do I what do I want to like call it? He's like a, a you know he'll be able to project magic in other places, which which kind of leads me to what I was going to say was uh like. If King eventually matures, maybe when they are able to get back to the human world, if King is able to tap into his Titan powers, maybe that'll help Luce, since she has such a strong connection to King, do magic even in the human world if Bellos invades the human world, like in a later season. Or later seasons. Because this seems very very much like a long-form saga type show, which I am here for. Um, Same, same, because... um... Also, since, well, just real quick side note, because we never really talked about it. I freaking mm-hmm. love King. Like, yeah, King, King to is the amazing. Fact, to the fact where uh, we initially see that he talks about his magic crown, and it's literally just a Burger King a crown. A Burger King crown. It's, uh, he is, he's so cute, but he's also just such a good character, man. Mm-hmm. Like, I, and, I, I, and, I, and I love it where... Uh, they do the uh, Quidditch episode, basically, mm-hmm. and uh, and he's like the armor of cheering or something like that, and yep. he's just and it's a, cheer, you know, and he's a little cheer, and then he, he just like yeah no no keep doing that keep doing that this is great because I look. and I love the fact that he's cute but yet they they acknowledge it. Yep. And, and and also he he embraces it because he feels like his cuteness gives him power over people, which it does. Um, it 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 does, and I and I love like just the little subtle moments from him, like how sometimes he'll actually nest and sleep in Ida's hair. 
Yep. And also he cur- he he curls up next to Luce like a little puppy. And um in the episode where Luce is going to school, he very much reacts like a puppy when she like, you know, comes home it's like, "Oh, where'd you go? Where'd you go? How are you?" you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, as someone with a new puppy, like I uh, I definitely know what those reactions and are. And also and also the fact that um there was an episode where uh Ida Ida decides to use her like magic string stuff to make loose a cloak. It was the second to last episode. I'm now remembering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh King's like, I wanna do something else too and then he uh he's like Yeah, he You're bakes not the, the only cake. one who can yeah. do evil and he makes yeah, he, a cake. He bakes a cake to hide inside of so he can burst out of it and surprise Luce. That is so fucking cute and so king. Oh man! Yeah, yeah. and I I just love King. He's pro- and also probably my King, favorite character. And also King, uh, like he makes friends. He's made friends with every member of the main cast in a very unique way. Obviously, he has that long time relationship with Ida, um, I, and Luce becomes one of his best friends very uh like early mm-hmm. on as well. But uh, like I mentioned earlier, he has a whole arc where he gets jealous of Luce's friends, and eventually they become buds too, especially him and Gus. Him and Gus are super tight now. To yeah, the point and where, like, Gus they're helps co- him they're through insecurities. Yeah, like they're co-announcers at Grom, which is so and, great. And I love it because King gets stage fright and he's like, um, I know what you're going to say, just imagine everyone in their underwear. And he's like, but I already do that. <laughs> and then Gus like, why would you do that? Yep. No, it's, it's pretty great. Uh but, but yeah, man. Um, but yeah, love King. Uh, but uh, but yeah, back to the theories, though. Yeah, the, one um, one more piece of speculation that I want to bring up the, just real quick because it's uh, it's super fast. Uh, I'm uh, something that you know um, a fr- a friend of mine, a regular commenter, uh, brought up quite a few times all throughout my uh, reviews is um, that um, Amity's parents are likely going to be kind of like um, a uh, secondary for loose. Um, and, Probably. um, uh, I, I, yeah, cause I, I definitely get like, again, Harry Potter references. Of course I'm going to do it. They have the Malfoy vibes. They feel like Lucius and Bellatrix, uh, not Bellatrix, fucking, um, Narcissa. Bellatrix is her sister. Uh, Lucius and Narcissa. They, they don't take my Potter card away, Potter fans. I know my names. I just fucking flipped it. Uh, don't. Yeah, but, don't, but yeah, that, that's probably true. But also, so, um, We've had this theory since the beginning, but uh, mm-hmm. Luz keeps referencing a book series about like how magic yeah, the good, in the world. Yep, uh, the Good Witch Azora, um, and we see that like it exists in uh, the Boiling Isles world too, and that Amity is a huge fan of it. Uh, yeah, I definitely believe we are going to eventually run into the Good Witch Azora. And um, she's going to serve as a mentor for not only Luce, but for Ida and Lilith as well, since they they have to basically learn magic from scratch now, as well. Yeah, and the and the thing is, is um, and it's a it's a very Steven Universe type plot device, yeah. right? Because that's because that's the thing with Steven Universe. Um, in the very first episode. One of the uh, little running gags in Steven Universe in that pilot episode is Cookie Cat, right? He is a little, his favorite ice cream sandwich, and it has that whole jingle, Cookie Cat, it's super duper yummy. Cookie Cat, he, he's the food for your tummy. Cookie Cat, he left his family behind. Cookie Cat, and he talks about and it talks about how he's a refugee from a from a war torn alien planet who now lives on Earth and is sworn to protect it. They literally tell you the future plot of Steven Universe in the first episode in a fucking ice cream sandwich jingle. So, this little tiny book that you think is just, you know, Luce's Harry Potter insert obsession is definitely going to be relevant to but, the plot. But also, in this, the thing that is to note about that, though, is that way too many times does the rules of the book apply to the rules of the world? Yep. That is and too real 
for her not to be a real person. Yep. And the obviously there's like look parallels in the cover design of uh, Azora as well. And like the story even parallels um, the story of the Owl House also parallels the story of the Good Witch Azora right down to the conversion of an ally, a, a former enemy into one of your strongest allies, which by the way, brings me to my second theory involving Amity's parents and Amity. So towards the end of the episode of the season finale, we see um, that uh, the emperor says, you know, don't worry, we'll be keeping a close eye on the residents of the Owl House. And we see a new member of the emperor's guard, it seems like, uh, wearing the same hoodie and uh, has a staff similar to those elite witches that we've seen, like, you know, where guard Ida and stuff like that. But and this has a different new... mask, though. Yep, has a different mask and is significantly shorter. Like, teenager size. And we know that Amity parents are supposed uh, likely very high up in Boiling Isle society. And Amity's big dream, even before she met Luce, is to become a member of the Emperor's Coven and eventually, you know, succeed Lilith as its new leader. Um, so I definitely think it's going to be one of those things where Amity takes the job as the spy reluctantly and then realize, uh, eventually realizes just how fucked up the Emperor is and then eventually, you know, obviously joins Team Owl House. Maybe. If Amity is this, you know, secret spy, which I'm, I'm definitely leaning towards because it just makes the most sense, causes the most drama. I mean, Maybe, the biggest word but... would be if it was somebody like Willow, but I doubt it would be Willow. Also, one other thing mm -hmm. is... um. I don't know why this might not have any like substantial evidence to it. Okay. But I feel like there's more to lose his mom than meets the eye. I definitely believe that. I I personally think the reason that so here's my theory. Um and I, I brought this up in like I think my review of either the pilot or the second episode. But my theory is the reason Luce's mom is so obsessed with being normal going back to Harry Potter is because someone in her family uh, was magical and it brought a lot of trouble. And so she wants her, her family to be as normal as possible. You look at Aunt Petunia from Harry Potter, right? Um, Aunt Petunia was a complete asshole to Harry his entire life. And she made, um, I mean, Vernon was also an asshole, but like she encouraged it. She also encouraged that behavior in Dudley because she was jealous of her sister Lily and because Lily's magic quote unquote brought them nothing but trouble. So she wanted, you know, an absolutely normal life. And I think maybe that Azora is Luce's grandmother and her mom is the daughter of Azora. And the reason why she was so obsessed with making Luce normal and go to the nor like the math summer camp was because she did not want her daughter to end up in the same kind of trouble her mom got into. Um, huh. So. Again, I'm Azura, just kind of like. Azura mm -hmm. equals Abuela. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, like that. Interesting. I'm just, you know, weaving together like Harry Potter knowledge and like kind of just theory crafting from like what I know of the Owl House so far. Oh, but, yeah, it, that's, it, that's... It's, it sounds like it's a possibility. I mean, uh, Remember what the big giant twist was for Owl House? I mean, not for Owl House, for uh, Gravity Falls. Yep, with Grunkle Stan, uh, with uh, Grunkle Ford, not Grunkle Stan. Yeah. Mm hmm. That's for sure. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much it for speculation. And look at that. We might actually make it on time with like enough time to not have to like speed run through plugs. Uh, but yeah, Brian, uh, so what are your final thoughts on Owl House? And, um, you know, uh, we already did talk about speculation, but what are you looking forward to the most with season two? Because it already has been renewed. Hopefully they'll give us an even 20 this time and not BS 19. Yeah, that would be cool. 
But also, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing some of these answers because I realize that this is a long form, so we're not going to get all of them. And also, yep. I would personally like to um, get some, like, more information about uh, What's-Her-Face's cronies. Because uh, they seem like they could be interesting characters. Um, uh, who's cronies? Uh, What's-Her-Face? Lily? Triclops. Oh, Basha. Basha's cronies. Okay, gotcha. Because uh, they were once Amity's friends, too. Yeah, and, and, uh, and in they, the Quidditch, uh, and they, in the Quidditch, yeah, they turned on they turned on Basha and was like, "Hey, Amity, uh, you know, Amity Willow, why don't you guys be on our team next year?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah." So yeah, they do they do seem to have a lot more depth to them as well. We could use all the allies we can get. Um, also, also, maybe some new characters. Yeah, and also I really like I I want to see this this type of episode at some point, and I'm sure they're gonna do it now that like. Ida and um, Lilith will have to learn magic from scratch, but I would love it if they have like a Happy Gilmore episode where Ida has to go back to school. That would be nice, and we know that they're not opposed to cliches and all because they did a body swap episode, but they and flipped the, the script the on that. And and a Breakfast Club episode, which by far is one of my favorite episodes of the entire season because yeah. the fucking Breakfast Club. Um, but uh but yeah uh so yeah um i'm i was surprised i thought we would actually go over time with this one because of how much you know uh, we we had to say but luckily well, we were able to rate it in cut a few things yeah we were able to rate it in and, tr- and trust me if we did not have a time limit with our recorder uh we would definitely go longer but uh we we got to get to plug i mean now. uh we didn't really touch upon the sister or the curse but uh oh yeah um, yeah, so real quick, the, the Lilith twist was pretty, like, I mean, I, I put it together right before it happened, and I was just like, oh, no. But luckily, I also called it, because on stream on Twitch, luckily Brian wasn't in the chat. I was like, no, 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 there's clearly good in Lilith. I think Lilith will redeem herself in the end. And thankfully, she did by sharing the curse with Ida and also taking away her own power so that Ida would be safe. Which, uh, by the way, I wonder if we're going to get to see a, like, a, like, Owl weird... Monster Lilith? Yeah. A Owl weird Monster dove Lilith. thing. Yep. Or whatever her animal was. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I think her animal was a raven. I think she was a raven. Um, so, were raven? That would be very oh, interesting. That would be pretty badass. Although, Ida's is more like an owl bear more than just a straight up owl. So, maybe like a raven bear? I don't know. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. But uh, there are other things that interesting. But uh, yeah, that's time limit. So, it for now, it was really good. I really liked it. Can't wait to see more. Yep. So, yeah, we have reached that special time of the night where we get to inform you guys what is coming up in the future on our channels. Of course, uh, you are currently on my one of, uh, my main channel, TV Time with Jay, uh, where I do all my TV reviews and such. And also, if you are interested in my more weedy side, you can check out Jay's Caldea, where I post anime trailer reactions, anime reviews, and, of course, uh, FGO or Fate Grand Order content for any of you guys who are also uh, willing residents of Gotcha Hell. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Brian, what is coming up for you, buddy? If I can reach it, um, I if I can reach it uh, by the time of tomorrow and I don't get distracted, I, I want to maybe start covering, uh, since Winona Earp is gone, maybe start covering Lovecraft Country. Okay, cool. Uh, nice. But it's a, it's, I need it's to an catch amazing up show. first. Yeah, I mean, it's not that, it's like four episodes, it's not that far. Um, but, um, anyway, um, because from what I saw from the first episode, I really liked it. And, it, and dude, it, it gets better each and every time. Trust me. There might Absolutely. be also um, two words. Well, three words. Ernie fucking Hudson. Yep. 
And uh, anything that man does is magic. And uh, 100%. Pun only partly intended because today's subject. But uh, there might be other stuff. But for now, that's the only like semi concrete thing. Okay. Me. So, so for me, in terms of stuff that's already out, I put out the Crunchyroll Anime Expo, um, the virtual version, because obviously world circumstances. Um, uh, has uh, come to us this past weekend, so I did trailer reviews or trailer reactions for uh, the Shield, uh, Rising of the Shield Hero season two, and Doctor Stone season two. Uh, there's a new anime that they're premier um, that's coming out in 2021 that I'm going to do a trailer reaction for. Um, it's like Eternity something. I'm going to do uh, so. I expect that on the Jay Scaldea channel. In terms of TV time with Jay, um, I've been covering Lovecraft Country pretty much since episode three because I reviewed the first two on Blair um, on this channel as well. It's a fantastic show. And also the boys are back in town and are weekly. So I'll be doing the boys as well. Um, I did the first three uh, yesterday or technically today. Uh, no. Yeah. Yesterday. Um, and we'll be doing four through eight on a weekly basis. Uh, because uh, Amazon decided to do the Hulu drop method rather than the Netflix drop method this season. And I fucking love the boys. I'm a huge fan of the comics. Absolutely love the show. So, of course, I'm going to cover it. So, looking but, forward to that. But also, because of that, we've had to last minute switch things around. Yep. Because we were originally going to do the boys because we thought it was going to be a binge drop like last season, but then I was like, "Oh shit, Brian, I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing episode four. Uh, I think, uh, and I look it up. It's like, "Yep, they're doing it weekly." Uh, so we actually get to do a show that we thought we were going to have to skip on because of the boys, um, and it is the final season of the uh, Netflix original teen drama Trinkets, uh, which is a show we actually did get to do on this version of the podcast, I believe. No, it was on the other one. No, it was on the other one again. God, the, I thought I had, I thought I had it this time. No, oh, well. sorry. Um, oh well. Uh, but regardless, uh, it's a great show. Uh, the first season is really short. Uh, it's Negasonic nothing Teenage around. Warhead is, a, is the it. main character. Yep. And, and also, uh, it's, um, it kind of, um, it kind of like. Has a commonality with our house and the fact that yeah, it, we... it has that. It, yep, there, there, yeah, there's definitely uh, similarities in personality between her and Luce uh, in not only the outcast sense but the ship sense as well. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, it's a uh, it's a very cute show. Nothing groundbreaking, but it's still you know a fun watch, a good palate cleanser. If you're a bit, you've been watching a lot of heavy stuff, uh, which is usually the case for us. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy that. Hopefully you have enjoyed this episode talking about the Owl House. This is one I've been anticipating. And, you know, uh, a couple of uh, my regulars who, uh, like, love the Owl House as well, you know, we're also anticipating this. Um, of course, you know, our buddy Mr. Multiverse is a huge fan of the show as well. Same with uh, Real Manos. So, y you know, uh, like, if all of us are into it, there's got to be something special there, and trust me, there mm -hmm. is. Uh, if you made it all the way this far and you haven't seen it, well, first of all, what's wrong with you? We just spoiled the whole show. But regardless, if you haven't and you just like hearing us talk, uh, go watch the show. What are you doing? There um, are a few yeah. things that we didn't touch upon. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but yeah, great show. Really loved it. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely go check it out. Um, but as always, uh, Brian's channel will be linked down below. Uh, my Twitch <laughs> channel, will be, my channel will be my uh, uh, my anime channel. Like I said, uh, Jay Scaldeo will be linked down below, and also my Twitch channel, which I don't plug as much. But uh, my Twitch channel, where I play Fate uh, Monday through Thursday, and Yu Gi Oh with my Brian and my friend Tony on Fridays. Ooh. Uh, Definitely check that out. We it's have a, a game great, on. We have a great time up there, and I am so close to getting affiliate. I am like, you know, almost to forty, and we need fifty uh, followers to get to affiliate. So if you want to help your boy out, uh, you know, link is in the description. 
I would really appreciate it. Obviously, you don't have to if you're just you're not interested in just watching me play games and you know talk about random subjects. Uh, then that's fine. Although if you listen to me talk for over half an hour about Owl House, I guarantee you'll enjoy uh, watching me talk for an hour while playing video games. Um, but yeah, definitely check that out as well. Also, I constantly forget to plug this, but I am a co-host on another podcast with my other good friend, Mimi, uh, aka Morganstein17 uh, from the Bat One podcast. We started up uh, our book reviews once again we uh, it's another reboot uh but this time we're calling it instead of book babble book dragon reviews and currently we are uh, covering uh like chapter by chapter or i guess double chapter by double chapter uh the sandman audio drama by uh audible uh with james mcavoy as morpheus neil gaiman narrating cat dennings as death an all-star fucking cast uh check it out it's a blast uh um, it's also on Anchor and available on all the different podcast platforms as well. And a quick shout out to all our listeners, not just the YouTube ones, but the ones on iTunes, Spotify, all the other platforms that Anchor allows yep. us to be on. You guys are great. We love you just we as much as the YouTube thank people. You. Yeah, seriously. We've built up a really great audience for such a small niche podcast, and uh, we're definitely grateful. Uh, but we'll catch you guys next time. Uh, hopefully you'll be here for our trinkets episode, but if not, right, um, peace. see you in the next review. Peace.